Hi, folks. I'm uh, George Lewis. I work for uh, Arena, a PTC company, and uh, I lead growth for the organization. So I'll, I'll do the moderation here. Uh, I was asked to introduce my team here of panelists, and so I'll go ahead and jump right into it here. Not in order of the background, I'll go in order on my page here. Um, Kevin Chu. Uh, Kevin is principal of the healthcare team at F Prime Capital. Uh, prior to F Prime, Prime Capital, Kevin was an associate consultant with IMS Consulting Group in New York, uh, where he advised biopharma biopharmaceutical clients on development and commercial strategy across multiple therapeutic areas. Kevin is currently based in the San Francisco office and works across the healthcare subsectors, including therapeutics, med tech, uh, healthcare IT and services, and also works closely with Eight Roads Ventures China healthcare team to manage F Prime's existing and uh, new investment efforts in China. So why is he here? F Prime uh, collaborates very closely with a venture uh, consortium in China and has experience uh, consulting with consulting companies and establishing cross-border partnerships between the US and China. Uh, Kevin is at the center of much of this work. Next, David Webster. Uh, David joins the executive team with decades of executive experience in medical device, imaging, and healthcare technology information. He's a passionate leader with a demonstrated track record of leading cross-functional teams from early clinical development to M&A, through uh, global commercialization in 60 different markets and geographies. He comes on board at a pivotal time in the company's journey, uh, bringing wealth of knowledge and expertise necessary to take Body Vision's business to the next level. David holds an MS in Business Administration and Management from Troy University and a BA in Psychology from the Citadel. So why, uh, why is our David here today? Uh, David has extensive experience in standing up glo global markets for emerging med tech companies. Uh, having done it with a previous venture, Neurologica Corporation, uh, which sold in over 60 countries. He plans to have Body Vision stood up in 60 countries by the end of 2024. Ryan McGinnis. Ryan has spent uh, 35 years in biotechnology, medical device, and R&D, engineering services industries. Uh, he's worked with many companies that have uh, applied innovative technologies to a range of markets, including cell and gene therapies, bioinstrumentation, medical devices, and in vitro diagnostics. At Triple Ring Technologies, Ryan leads a team of world-class scientists and engineers who work at the junction of complex biology and cutting-edge technology. As an active participant in the Silicon Valley innovation ecosystem, Ryan also spends time connecting early stage companies to the infrastructure, know-how, and funding needed to successfully bring new products to market. Ryan was trained in genetics and molecular biology at the University of California at Davis. He is co-inventor of six US patents and has published multiple scientific communications and presents frequently at the International Science and Technology co Conferences. So, why is Ryan here? Ryan and his team support clients with a product development and market, uh, market entry globally and have strong partnerships in Japan and other parts of Asia, which are extremely relevant to this panel. And then finally, Matthias Bellman. Matthias is director, global focus team cardiovascular at TUD, or S, uh, TUD SUD, excuse me. Prior to joining TUV SUD, he spent over 12 years at Biotronic in roles of increasing responsibility around business development, strategic marketing, product marketing, product management, communication, and more. He earned his Bachelor of Arts and Master of Arts in European Management from uh, Technische. <laughs> it's, it's German. It's German. Uh, Hanschlu Waldu. So why is uh, Matthias here today? Uh, TUVSD provides uh, testing and inspection services worldwide at over a thousand locations. Uh, they have a deep European exper expertise and also a, a broader global focus uh, via their global market access GMA services, uh, determining applic applicable international regulations and managing product compliance to those regulations. So welcome, gentlemen. If we can give them a round of applause, we'll kick things off here. Excellent. Excellent. All right, so first question for the, the panel here is around uh, market prioritization and preparation. Uh, so guys, for emerging med tech companies aiming to expand internationally, what, what criteria should they consider when identifying potential market uh, markets, assessing market readiness, and strategizing to minimize risks while successfully entering new regions? Matthias, I'll let you take the lead on this one. Sure, so first of all, 
TÜV Süd uh, is a notified body for MDR in the Europe, uh, in Europe. So this is also why I'm taking maybe a little bit more of a European perspective on this question. Um, we've heard a lot about MDR is bad. Uh, it's prohibiting innovation. Uh, now the companies won't come to the European market anymore. And I think maybe this is not the complete truth anymore. I think we will not see the same level of first line in Europe uh, product uh, uh, development. But I think it's not a question either if it's FDA or MDR. I think it's a FDA and MDR. And if you do the planning already with the, for your FDA strategy with the MDR in mind, I think there are a lot of synergies that then bring your product not just from the uh, to the US market successfully, and I think we will not change that anymore. The FDA uh, first strategy is here to stay. Um, but I think you can have a su successful strategy by minimizing your risk while keeping already uh, uh, the European market in, in the back of your head. I mean, Europe in the end accounts for 25% of the global medtech market. Um, we are talking about almost 450 million people in Europe with, I think, a very nicely uh, built up uh, um, a healthcare system uh, that is ready to take on innovation when it's approved. And uh, when we're talking time to market, I'm representing basically under the TÜV Süd umbrella, we have now two notified bodies that we can do. And there are even, let's say, fast track options that, like, if you're ready, we are ready, and I think we can also work getting CE approval on your product quite fast. Gentlemen, other thoughts? Yeah, it's, it's, so regulatory is incredibly important, of course, for accessing markets. But another kind of higher level thing is, is understanding who your partners are and what types of partners you will need uh, in the geographies that you're going into. And so uh, very often if we're leaving home and going into uh, new geographies, we need what we call jungle guides, uh, folks who are on the ground and understand um, not just who the patients are or what the specific problems of a given population uh, might be, but uh, who to access uh, for regulatory help or for financing or for um, supply chain and these types of things. And so no matter where you are or where you're going, uh, these development programs or this, this innovation work it uh, needs teams, it needs partners, it's complicated, um, and we need friends to do this. It's, a, it's an important part to figure out who you're going to be working with anywhere you go. Yeah, it make, makes a lot of sense. Uh, Kevin, any thoughts? David? No, I mean, I, I completely agree. I think, I think for us, it's, it's maybe um, uh, a, a slightly more straightforward answer to your direct question, which is just you have to follow where the money is, right? And, and depending on what the product is, depending on what indication it's serving, you know, certain markets will offer a very favorable economic value proposition that you should go after, um, whereas others you know, may not make as much sense. But I think to Ryan's point, understanding the complexities of navigating that market, what resources you need to tap into or invest in in order to get access to that market, I think are all part of the equation as well. Yeah, I like the thoughts that uh, Ryan had in the Jungle Guide. I mean, oftentimes entering a new market for anybody, like ourselves included, I mean, you really need to know those local regulations. Yeah, and I think you can do that um, by finding a good distributor in each country. So having commercialized a bunch of times now, uh, what I do is, first of all, you're going to get a response from the doctors as you go out and you go to trade shows, and you're going to see where the interest lies, the clinical interest. Then what Kevin said is you take a look and say, does the product make financial sense? Because if it's too expensive, it's not going to move. Then you look at what the total available market is in that country. So you take a country like India with a huge market, right? And, um, and, a, and a reasonable regulatory process. And you can, you can jump off in, in those countries very easily. And then of course, when you find your distribution partner, most of them have their own regulatory team and they'll guide you through the process. Who holds the regulatory? That's a negotiation. But a lot of those teams have a clinical team, they have a sales team, they have a service team. And they'll guide you through, and they'll launch the product for you. And you just have to make sure that they can hold, they can cover down on the product in the country. And 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 it's it's not a terribly complex formula, um, and you sort of feel your way through it uh, as you go. But the distributors, uh, as Ryan said, the distributors will be your guide. They'll let you know if you're priced right. They'll let you know if you don't have any distribution interest. Well, there's your answer. Uh, they they don't think they can make money. But uh, distribution is the key, good distribution. 
All right, thanks, folks. Uh, next question is around regulatory complexities. So uh, what significant challenges and opportunities has the EU MDR posed for the life sciences industry uh, since its inception? And how have companies navigated these changes to ensure compliance and continued innovation? <laughs> Nightmare. Right? We were already Nightmare. debating in the hallway, but uh, yeah. Yeah. No, no, you, I, I think, you, I think you, you had a valid point. Of course, if you look at it from the, since the 2017 inception, yes, I think the perception was that it's a big mess and it, it was a gigantic change, I think, for every medtech company in the world. Um, we are still working through it. Uh, the MDR extension, however, has cooled down the pressure on the, us as notified bodies. And yes, we are quite uh, aware of our image also in that uh, regard. Um, we are working through it. We are working with manufacturers. Um, I think the biggest recommendation from our side we can make is come talk to us. Come talk to us early. Um, come talk to us about what you have. The MDR now gives us the opportunity also to talk to you. We call it structured dialogue. Um, there is actually, even if you're talking about submission in 2026, even now would be a good point in time to reach out, to get first contact. Um, gets most of these uncertainties out of the way, and I think then there can be a collaboration between notified bodies and manufacturers. Yeah, in, in the EU's defense, and FDA is still not making things super easy, um, and I don't know how many have seen the recent guidance on cybersecurity, but essentially any medical device with a USB port uh, is going to be subject to the new guidance around uh, cybersecurity. And that's an onerous guidance and uh, expensive uh, to, to meet. So it's, uh, these are challenges that no matter where you go, you're going to find. I could say this. I've led two companies through it now. Uh, Neurologica, we were one of the first people to get EU MDR in the U.S. And most recently at Body Vision, we got it about six weeks ago. It was, it was a nightmare scenario, I'm going to tell you. Um, they're backed up. Uh, they can't do the inspections. They've had to extend it. We, we all knew that there was going to be an extension because we were all talking to each other and everyone was like, this ain't happening, right? Then the, the UK broke away from it and I don't know what they're up to over there. They've got their own thing going on. But it was a whole, it, it, you know, I'm just being, I'm very, very pragmatic about it, right? Um, from our side, it, it took a lot of manpower. It took a lot of time to do it. Um, it was very disjointed. My hope is it gets better and it flows a little bit better, but I don't think they're through the woods yet. I think it's going to take another year before it sort of levels out. C mark, dream. Why did we change it? I don't know why. It was perfect. Um, we could get to market super fast. We could start selling products over there uh, and get things going and then sort of bring it to the U.S. And now it's, I think it's the opposite. It, they're both equally complex, so why not go for the FDA first? And then, and then pick up the EU MDR, and then we'll figure out what the Brits are doing at some point. Kevin, is there a VC view on this one? No, I, I, think, I think I echo, um, at least through the transitive property, echo through my portfolio companies what uh, the gentleman to my left and right have, have already shared. It, it does seem like it's, uh, there's a lot of turbulence right, caused by um, MDR, and people are still figuring it out. Obviously, the extension helps uh, to mitigate the blow a little bit, but... Um, I think it just heightens the need for um, a lot of information as you're thinking about whether or not you want to prioritize that path versus going straight into FDA. And um, again, you know, I think in certain indications for certain products, the the the, the headache and the investment and resources and um, uh, expert kind of consultants to to navigate you through the process is warranted because the upside is there, right? And, uh, we saw that in uh, one of our recent companies um, that was in um, uh, EP, right? Um, uh, upon getting the uh, MDR, you know, saw significant sales, right? Over the over the the first 12, 24 months. So I think it really depends. You know, it's interesting. I mean, I'd be curious if the the other gentlemen up here have a view on this. I mean, is it the type of device determines which market you may choose to enter first? Does that have a an impact on it? I would say maybe less so type of device and more so the specific indication and kind of the market dynamics around that. Interesting. Right. I'll tell you what, uh, I was in imaging before and now I'm in AI. There's a lot of confusion in AI. Like we're, we're going into China now and China hasn't made up his mind. 
the FDA made up its mind, there was a backlog, and then suddenly, boom, they made a decision and everything sort of flooded through. So, and the cybersecurity piece is, is becoming significant. I mean, that's, you gotta, anything that connects, you gotta bake something in. And there's a lot of documentation that goes with that, and then when you're dealing with individual hospitals, and it, it's, it's, it's super complex, so it's, it's uh, uh, there's still things that are being defined uh, as we speak. Yeah, yeah, I mean, regula regulation's complicated by virtue of the fact that it's always changing. I mean, we deal with that all the time in the software side of things, too. It's always updating, and you have to keep up with it. So, All right, so moving on, uh, next question around partnerships. Uh, while seeking global expansion, uh, what proven strategies can U.S.-based firms employ to foster strong and mutually beneficial collaborations with international partners? Uh, David, I had you tagged to take this one. Okay, this is an interesting one, right? Because you're going to go out there and you're going to deal with dealers. Okay, and dealers are all over the map. So the first thing you have to do is figure out a good vetting process, right? What's their reputation? How well are they known in the market? What are their financials, right? Because they'll tell you and promise you the whole uh, world. And then you have to have a good distribution document. Right. Once you vet them out and you, you talk to references, talk to other companies, talk to some customers, um, then you have to have a great contract uh, to cover it. And you just you have to visit them. You really do. They'll show you pictures and all the rest of it. But meet with them, go visit them, see their operation, talk to them. They all have key opinion leaders and everything. And just make sure they have what it takes. And frankly speaking, some of the products are too heavy a lift for the dealers. There are two, sales isn't the issue, it's the service and the clinical lift, right? Do they have the wherewithal to really support the product? Europe is becoming a problem child because, because of the union, I'm not bashing Europe today, I'm just, these are facts, I'm spitting facts. <laughs> because they've united now, you'll have a dealer who feels like they can cover all of Europe. But Europe is very different from state to state to state. So, so despite the being united, and despite us wanting to look at Europe like it's the United States, where you can get one dealer to cover a region or a bunch of states, you really need to find country distributors. And that's a pain, because you want to sort of give it to one person and let them run with it. But the reality of it is I've tried that, and it just doesn't work. So you really need, you know, you can have like a company that covers Benelux and a company that, you know, there's, there's sort of congregations over there, but you probably need three or four uh, good distributors to cover that country and provide the, what they need. Yeah, and maybe just to, to echo, completely agree with everything David said, maybe to, to echo or emphasize two points. So one, um, we've seen so many times when a company – uh, has gotten really excited about the first inbound uh, distributor, right? And then all of a sudden, they're they're mentally married to that that distributor, and they don't do the diligence, and they don't go out and kind of scan the field and see see what other options are out there. Um, I, I completely agree, with David. Uh, take the time to really survey, ask peers that you trust who have gone through the process, who understand those markets. You know, what are some of the other people that I should be talking to? Um, and, and, and really take the time to do that work. Completely agree with that. Keep an eye on your price, too, because I'll tell you, they'll play games. They'll jack it up, they'll lower it, and then you lose control of it. So keep an eye, keep an eye, eye on what they're selling it for. Yeah, and, and another uh, very pragmatic thing to think about is when you're going into fragmented markets, um, look at your product, look how it's going to address problems in those specific markets, and then prioritize which markets you do first, second, third, fourth. Uh, don't try and go after too many all at once. Establish something in a region and then grow from there. Matthias, I saw your head nodding there. I th you have a reaction? Other than we are the problem child. Um, <laughs> um, I, I think what you mentioned is, is valid. Also with the importing into the EU, uh, also the MDR there plays a little bit of a role uh, that they need to be the authorized representatives for you. So keep an eye out for the proper documentation that they are prepared on their end to receive your product and are you know part of that whole value chain uh, of documentation that you bring. Excellent. So on to uh, risk mitigation. Uh, what are your thoughts on reimbursement as a commercial risk for early stage in innovators? Uh, Ryan, any, any thoughts on that? 
Yeah, for early stage innovation and for early stage companies, what we've seen over the last uh, few years is that when you think of business risks, uh, the, the primary risk has always been funding, uh, the, the financial risk. When, when are you going to get, where are you going to get your next round? Um, and then it was regulatory risk very often. And then some form of in reimbursement. Now reimbursement has leapfrogged the regulatory risk, um, and especially here in the United States. And um, so it's a, one of these uh, elements in a business plan and business modeling that has been brought much further up the chain in terms of uh, when you consider it and when you think about it and when you strategize for it. Um, so it's, it's become a very, very important part of a company's existence. I'd say cost. The two systems are basically at odds. There's the United States, which is how much revenue can we drive out of it? How much revenue can we get for the technology? And then when you leave the United States and go elsewhere, they're like, how do we lower the costs? So we love to charge for capital. We love to charge for consumables per case. That's a great model in the United States, but that model doesn't work in a lot of countries. So you might find out that you have this great thing that's sort of working here with the GPOs and the IDNs and everything's going well, and you go to another country and they're like, we can't afford the cost of the capital, we can't afford the upkeep of the equipment, and we certainly can't afford the case-by-case -case consumable. It's just not... Uh, big enough, which is why in a lot of cases surgical robots aren't playing in other countries because the, the capital cost is too much, the cost of ownership is too much, and then the, uh, the cost of the consumables is too much. And then if you try and go through a distributor, it's such an electromechanically complex product, they can't provide the support. So it doesn't make sense. Like in the U.S., you see a lot of the robot companies, they park a rep in the OR with the robot for every case. Won't work in Europe won't work in many of the countries. There's not enough meat on the bones for it. So I think you really gotta look at that. What's the cost of your product? What's the cost of acquisition, ownership, and, a fee, and, the, and per case? And it just might not work. You know, we were talking in the hallway before we hopped in here, and it's just in the US, it seems like there's a lot more um, comfort, maybe not comfort, but uh, it's more acceptable to ask for everything and try to compete with the hospital down the road, uh, where in the European market, maybe less so. I mean, certainly we've talked to companies at Arena that do, you know, proton beam therapy and things along those lines, and all of a sudden you need to build a bunker around the device because it's shooting out protons. So um, any other thoughts on the subject, guys? Yeah, I, th I think you're exactly right. I think um, uh, even the build-out costs of a lot of the stuff just doesn't work. So it's, it's, a whole different, it's, a, it's a whole different world having traveled to all these countries and went into the hospitals, talked to the administration. It's like two separate worlds. I used to say it's like the Wizard of Oz, right? The United States, uh, the rest of the world is like Dorothy, and then when she pops the doors open and walks into Oz and it goes to color, it's like, boom, that's how stark the... The differences can be, not in all countries, but in, in many of them, especially, uh, it, it depends where you go. I mean, they're just, they, they're not, they don't have the resources to put into medical care like we do here. And I know there's a lot of discussion about who's got better, better medical care, but we got a lot going on over here. We got a lot of good stuff. So it's different, real different. Excellent. Uh, so another question on, uh, on the Asian markets. You know, we've talked a lot about the state of regulations in the US and Europe. Uh, do you have some insight on the challenges of entering the Asian markets? Kevin, do you have thoughts on that one? Yeah, and I, I might expand it beyond just challenges because I think, you know, the conventional wisdom, especially when, when you're dealing with maybe markets like China uh, for the first time, is that it's really tough. The way of doing business is very different. Um, you know, Maybe they don't respect IP, et cetera. Like, there are all these mantras that, that I think get perpetuated through the industry. But I think from our perspective, where we sit, especially because we actually deploy a good amount of our portfolio across Asia, China being one of the biggest markets for us, I think we've seen in situations where you have two companies, one in the West, one in China, that have mutually aligned incentives, we've seen that be very successful. Um, in a way that benefits both parties, right? For the US company, maybe it's on top of just gaining access to the China market, which you know, no Western company should ever try to do alone, uh, even the strategics for that matter, right? 
uh, even the guys with a lot of resources, just because they're different. Um, so in addition to gaining market access, we've seen companies uh, gain access to cheaper manufacturing, right? Or a partner that can help them with the Gen 2 that optimizes for COGS. Um, in a way, in, in, in a time frame um, that they would never have been able to achieve uh, by themselves. And so I, I think for us, we, we actually think of it less as necessarily challenges and more just kind of how do you navigate your way to, to a successful arrangement. And I think at the root of it, it kind of comes back to something that Ryan said early on, which is you've got to find people that you trust. Um, and uh, there's, there's no shortcut for doing that except to really spend the time, go to the local market, um, you know, talk to people who are kind of in those spaces, um, and then slowly wiggle your way to someone who you can genuinely trust. You feel like, after critical analysis of what, they're, what it is that they're after, that there's clear alignment and incentives. Um, and then obviously, uh, to something that David said, making sure that you have a very good contract um, and that you spend on, on good legal to, to, to ensure that. Um, I think when you pull all those things together, what we've seen is a lot of really successful relationships. And so we, we try to foster that in, or we try to advocate for exploring those types of partnerships in all of our companies um, when we make investments. Makes a lot of sense. Uh, Ryan, anything to add from your experience? I mean, I know we talked about that earlier. Has Triple Ring played a role there? Um, yeah, it's interesting for us. I, I, for the, the work that we've done in Asia, it's much more focused on Japan now. Um, and it is, it's very unfortunate um, because China was, is a fantastic market. Um, but as you say, um, it's cooled down for many of us to be bringing products and technologies into. And it's not because of regulatory and it's not because of market size or, or need. It's purely, I guess you could say political almost, right? Um, or geopolitical. And so that's very, very unfortunate, but there's uh, opportunity there if you have the right partners and if you set it up correctly. Um, and then, but you look all around the rest of Asia, um, they are filling gaps and are, are good markets, not nearly as big, um, but still uh, worthwhile places uh, to be, be you know, investigating and, and, and seeing if you can bring more product into. So it's, um, it's a constant evolution. I talk three markets, right? There's a bunch of them. There's Singapore, there's Indonesia, there's Malaysia. Well, let's talk three. China, Japan, and Korea. They're all protected markets. I mean, they protect their market, right? So know that when you go in. You absolutely need a local company that's somehow connected, right? Thing in China, it's a long regulatory process. It costs money. You want to hold your ownership of that there, even if you do it through a company, you want to hold the regulatory because if you don't like them, you can get rid of them and you can find another company. One of the issues with China too is that if you manufacture there, a percentage of the machine, it's, there's a little slide rule there, you get priority when it comes to government contracts. So you have to find a partner, it depends what you sell, who can do some manufacture or do assembly there at least, which gets you preference if there's a competitive bid. Japan also has a really long process. And if you're in the radiation business, they're very radiation sensitive for a lot of reasons and they have a lot of rules. And they're also an imaging uh, con uh, con uh, country. They have imaging companies, they have scope companies, so they protect those markets uh, very strong. Uh, in Korea, the same thing goes. If they have local stuff, they'll slow it down. It'll, it'll just be, I mean, it's doable. I've been in all three. I work in all three. They're great markets, but you got to find that local partner. And with respect to China, everybody's worried about China stealing your ideas. I haven't really seen that. Uh, they're smart enough to know now that they got to keep that under control. And if you have a good partner over there, first of all, you can file your patents over there. Second of all, if you have a good partner over there, they'll protect you, right? Because they're usually a distribution partner. They're not going to try and steal the manufacturing. So they'll sort of keep an eye on things and, and keep things going. But those seem to be the three more challenging countries. The rest, you can sort of slide in pretty easily. Um, they have high populations and, and you can use them, but it's, it's, it's tough. Yeah, I, but speaking of Japan, they are lowering barriers, and there are companies uh, that are are very actively trying to re reduce the friction for introduction of, of products into Japan and also coming back out of Japan. So most of the large uh, medical corporates in Japan have U.S. 
uh, CVCs and U.S. operations that are doing just this, building relationships, uh, understanding product and how they fit in the Japanese market and vice versa, and it's, it's succeeding and will only get better over time. All right, so guys, parting thoughts on the, the subject of uh, international expansion and cross-border partnerships for med tech companies. Matthias, any thoughts there? Sure, so I think we've covered a lot of different aspects here in the round. Um, I think what we all can agree on is that communication, early communication, good planning, um, like let's say from my pers perspective building also especially a regulatory strategy, Combined with a lot of testing, I think there's like things that you can prepare that you need probably in multiple regulatory areas of the world for from biocom to packaging. The, you know the rules are similar uh, in in that regard, and I think you can build already a strategy in, up front. Uh, talk about it, get input, get a CRO uh, on board. Uh, maybe even quicker um, that helps also with the translation into local regulatory uh, schemes and and then um, I think yeah the FDA first strategy is probably here to stay and then let's see uh, where it takes you from there uh, yeah I guess uh, back to partnerships uh, I think you stick to the mission and, and one of the wonderful things about medical device and healthcare broadly is it's a mission-driven industry. And we, by and large, as an industry, we're here to help one another and collaborate and do it quite well. And so leverage that and keep your eye on the fact that you're here to help patients and you will find willing partners in any country who want to help you do that. And those are the ones you want to keep. Yeah, I think maybe just parting thoughts. So. Again, yeah, I come back to the idea that you know international market expansion or international strategy is really a case by case, um, depending on what you're doing, um, what product, what indication, and what those local market dynamics are um, in the various geographies that you're considering. I think the prioritization has to look different. There isn't a blanket strategy. In order to inform that, um, I think taking the time finding the right sources of information, not to throw shade on any of the kind of the, the market research firms, but I've seen so many kind of market reports where the data is just off completely, right? And I think the best source of information, talk to the distributors on the ground, talk to the people who are actually working in those local markets and then get real, real, real world data, right? Um, use that to inform you know, your calculations around uh, what, is the, what is the return that I actually get from trying to get into this market, and then based off of that, prioritize your markets. Um, and then lastly is find the right partner uh, and, and make sure you do the full diligence. Uh, don't skimp on it because in the long run, um, I think it'll, it'll pay dividends. Excellent. David, any parting thoughts? Or? I think it's, if your product's good, it's worth it. It's worth it. It's, 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 it's a, ha, having uh, run around the world for a bunch of years. Um, and I'll tell you, Sort of the block and tackle of it is this. Go to the, when you're in a specific market, if you think the product makes sense to go internationally, the price is right and all that, just go to the international meetings in your area of expertise and set up a 10 by 10 booth and they'll come to you like flies, right? The distributors and everybody and they'll learn about it and they'll talk to you and you can get a sense, you know, meetings like Medica, Arab Health, China Med, you can go for short money, it's a lot of travel, but you can go and you can get a sense on the ground. And by the way, if you go to some of the world congresses too, you'll get a bigger collection. And a bunch of them come to the US shows too. And it starts with listening to the doctors, do they think it'll work? And then you'll start finding the people. But I'll tell you, at, at Neurologica, it saved our company because we started the company in 04. Against the wishes of my board, I decided to go international. In 08 to 09, the market collapsed in the US. But here's the beauty of the international market. They operate under a tender. And once a tender is on the move, it can't be stopped. So the year that the US just pulled the plug on everything, all the tenders came in. So then the, by the time the tenders slowed down, the US market grew again. So it's sort of like playing a roulette table where you put something on black and red and even and odd, and no matter where the ball lands, you end up winning. 
And that's, that's helpful for a, a small company in generating revenue. So if you can make it work, uh, it, 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 work, it's work it works. But there is a formula, and that formula consists of a lot of the, the uh, things everybody at the panel said, all things to consider. That was a fantastic panel today, guys. Thank you for your time. Uh, let's give them a round of applause. It was a great session today.